So I've been wanting to do this all-in sermon series with you and felt led that it was time to do it. Uh, beginning of 2019, that I wanted you to be a congregation and families who decide that in 2019 you're going to be all in. Can I tell you that I remember when that happened in my family? I remember when uh, my parents, they even made a New Year's resolution that they were going to be at church. I remember that. I remember they made a New Year's resolution and they told us as a family, they said, hey, we made a goal to be at church. Uh, that Jesus saved us and he redeemed us and he was going to be a priority. That he was who mattered the most. I remember my parents setting us down as kids and telling us that. And I remember their life changing as they devoted their life to King Jesus. I remember them being all in. There's a verse of scripture in James chapter 4 verse 14. You don't need to turn there. I'm going to read it to you. We're going to be in uh, Luke chapter 7 today or this morning. But in James 4 it says this, Yet do you not know what tomorrow, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? What is your life? Listen to this. For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. You are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. So if I had a rope and it was stretched out for eternity and I was to hold up this rope, your life would only be just a very small portion of it. Very small portion would be your life. Because your life is a mist. People say it all the time, especially uh, the ones older in the room. They tell me all the time, you better enjoy this time with your kids. It only lasts for a second. They're only shaking their head. Yeah, it's gone. Your life is short. So will you waste it? I kind of preached on this last week. Will you waste it on the temporal for worldly satisfactions, or will you be all in and sell out for Jesus? Will you be all in? Everything about your life, you're devoted to Christ and bringing Him glory. Any Gladiator fans, movie Gladiator? No? Anybody want to admit to it? I enjoy the movie Gladiator. Okay? No? A few movies. Okay. Well, I like it. All right, so... Um, there's a quote in Gladiator. Some of you do too. You're closet likers of Gladiator. I know it. Men, be manly. Raise your hand. You, you like Gladiator. Okay, there we go. Um, there's a quote in there, and you'll know it. What we do in this life echoes in eternity. It's true. What you do in this life echoes in eternity. You will live, either live eternally in heaven laying up treasures in heaven so that you can bow at the feet of Jesus or you'll spend eternity in hell for what you do in this life and who you follow in this life. And so you must ask the question then, what really matters in this life? What really matters? Because that's what you devote your life to. What really matters? Uh, in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 9 through 11, it says this, so I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. And my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desire, desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure. For my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil that I had expended in doing it. And behold, listen to what he says. All this that I desired, I brought to myself. All the pleasure I want, I went and gathered for myself. Then I considered all that my hands, all that my hands had done and the toil that I extended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity, a striving after wind, 
and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. So he said, anything I wanted, anything I desired, I went and grabbed in this world. And he said, it was all vanity, excessive pride, and admiration of one's own appearance or achievements, worthless. He lived his whole life, whatever he wanted, he went and did and grabbed and, and all the wisdom and all the treasure. He said he had king's treasure. He had it all. He said, it's all vanity. It's all worthless. He says this in Ecclesiastes, at the end of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13. This is what he says. For, I uh, see, now all has been heard. Here, in, is this, here is the conclusion of the matter. For all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. That's where he landed. That's where he landed. To fear God. To honor him. And so I got to ask you, here you are going in 2019. What really matters? What are you going to devote your life to? Who are you going to follow? Are you going to look to this world to satisfy you? Are you going to delight in this world? Or are you going to look to Jesus? Because what you do in this life will echo for eternity. That, that is, that's true. So what are you going to devote your life to now? To the creator of the world? The sustainer? The master? The Lord? The only way to be reconciled back to God? Who are you going to devote your life to? Are you going to devote your life to yourself and your wants and your family? Or are you going to be all in for Christ? That's the question I have for 2019. Are you going to be all in or not? Charles Spurgeon says this, my favorite quote. I've read it multiple times. I'll read it probably the rest of the time that I'm here for a long time. He says this. If Christ is not all to you, he is nothing to you. We need to get that in 2019. If Christ is not all to you, he is nothing to you. We have to quit playing games with Christianity and calling ourselves believers and followers. If he's not everything to you, you're not a follower. Period. He's not here to play games with you. He's not here to be a part savior. Listen to what it says. He will never go into partnership as part savior of men. It's not how it works. If he be something, he must be everything. And if he be not everything, he is nothing to you. Man, that's a wake up call for American church. It truly is. He's everything to you or he's nothing to you. You can devote your life to the treasures of this world. And at the end of your life, your short little life, you will have accomplished nothing but eternal life in hell. That's the reality. James is telling us that. Ecclesiastes is telling us that. Charles Spurgeon is telling us that. And I am trying to tell you that. That if you devote your life to this world you will be found unsatisfied in the short little life that you have. I've been, uh, I've been sick since I've been back from Africa. A lot of you don't know that. Some of you do. Now you know. Like some sermons you look weak, Pastor. Yeah, some sermons I am weak. I've been sick. I think Lord blood work came back good and um, other stuff came back good I don't want to talk to you about. Um, uh, and so they're checking to see if I have a parasite or something like that. And so when I have these conversations with people, it kind of goes like this. Man, I don't know if I go over there. I'm scared of getting some parasite or disease. You're going to have to die somehow. I mean, let's be real. Your, your short little life is going to come to an end somehow. I think I'd rather it be from going to Africa. Telling people about Jesus. I would like to raise my kids. But I'm not sovereign. I can't add another day to my life. I can't. And you can't either. You can't add a cubic to your height. You can't add another day to your life. So I'm going to trust the one who's sovereign. I'm going to devote my life to him. That's what I'm going to do. And that's what we are all called to do. But here's what's happening in the church. 
the church, American church too. Um, the church, you know, overseas, they're devoting their life, they're dying for their faith. American church, uh, we're consuming. That's what we are, we, we just consume. We come in, we sit in the pew, we listen to a sermon, maybe we remember it, maybe we don't. We go home, we watch a little football, go take a nap, go to work. Never talked about Christ. We don't witness to our neighbor. We never led someone to the Lord. We barely give. Sometimes we're at church maybe twice a month. Sometimes we're not. And we just consume. We call ourselves Christians. That's what's happening in American church. People are consuming. Worship is about them. And, and, and if it fits into their lifestyle, then maybe they'll be there. And if it fits into their sports schedule, maybe they'll be there. Maybe. We're either all in or we're not. We can't play with it. This, this is what's happening in American churches. Uh, and the leading churches, the churches, some of the most, the biggest, fastest growing churches, man, they're just, they're just preaching this consumer gospel, this therapeutic gospel. And they are growing, let me tell you. One of the seventh fastest growing churches in America is in Chattanooga. You know that? Chattanooga. And they preach heresy every Sunday. It's a word of faith church and they make it man-centered and even so much to say that the reason, this is what he said, that the reason the church, I mean, sorry, the reason earth revolves, moves in a circle, is because God wants people to be awake because the only, God's not sovereign and the only way that he can be let into earth is when man prays and allows him to come. So God always needs somebody awake. The seventh fastest growing church. So who's it about? It's about man. It's about man allowing God. Elevation Church in Charlotte, Stephen Furtick. If you listen to him, please stop. Okay? Stop. This last sermon that he preached, people were blowing up on Facebook about it. And he was talking about how your experiences deliver you and how they make you triumph over your enemy. Where do we find that? It's not about you. It's not about you. Your situations are, by God's sovereignty, draw you closer to him. Your enemies you're supposed to love. But we, we fall for this stuff. That's where the American churches is going. Some of the fastest growing churches in America are all about me and me centered and me consuming and me getting what I want. And Ecclesiastes is very clear on this. He went and got everything he wanted. He consumed and he consumed and consumed and he said, it's all vanity. The only thing that matters is to fear God and to keep his commandments. And I want to tell you that as well. The only thing that really matters in your life is if you devote all in to Jesus. Because your short little life will come to an end and then you'll have the chance to spend eternity bowing at Jesus' feet who is the sovereign, all-wise creator of the world. Who gave his life for you. So are you all in? Are you all in? Matthew 15, verse 8 says this. This people, honor, this people honors me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. And that's what I see with this consumer driven American church. That's what I see. They want to come in, they want to say that they're Christians. But does their life line up? Their devotion, what they, who they surrender to, does that line up? So your mouth says you believe the gospel, but what does your life say? What does your sacrifices say? What does your devotion say? What does your pocketbook say? What does it say? You're all in for Jesus? Or all in for consuming? So, Pastor, that's hard to hear, but that's the gospel. That's the gospel. You deny yourself. You take up your cross and you follow Jesus. 
You deny yourself. You die to yourself to exalt Jesus. That's the gospel. And man, that's hard to hear for us in America. But overseas, it's not hard for them. It's not hard for them. They give their life every day for the name of Jesus. They're persecuted every day for the name of Jesus. They're baptized publicly knowing that they may die because they were baptized publicly. Because Jesus is worthy. But here in America, we... We sometimes miss the boat and we get it wrong. The apostles did not consume. <laughs> they died badly for the name of Jesus. Why? Because they devoted their life to him. Paul was beaten, stoned, thrown in prison. Why? Because he sold out for the name of Jesus. So he was all in. God calls us to go and make disciples. And we call ourselves Christians. We're not getting persecuted. We're not getting beaten. We're not getting thrown in prison. And we still don't go tell our neighbor about Jesus. Now figure that one out. We're not persecuted. Not beaten. Not stoned to death. And still won't tell people about Jesus. So I have to ask, are you all in or not? Is Jesus Lord of your life? Is He everything to you? Because it's easy for me just to preach a consumer gospel and make it about you. And Jesus is the second chair in your life. And sometimes you come to church, you praise His name, and you're good to go for eternity. That's easy to preach. What's hard to preach is the actual truth. That you have to follow Jesus and deny yourself and die to yourself. That's what's hard to preach. But it's the truth. And I'm held accountable to tell you that. So let's look at... Luke chapter 7. We're going to go to verse 36. Luke 7, verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked him, asked Jesus, to eat with him. So a Pharisee is asking Jesus to eat with him. When you start to read it, you're like, good for the Pharisee, right? Good for him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. So Jesus goes in, he reclines at the table at the Pharisee's house. Verse 37. And behold, a woman of the city. So I want to be very clear. That is a sinner by trade. If you understand what I'm saying, parents. A, behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, a sinner by trade, okay? When she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster, the alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with, oil, with ointment. Don't you see what's happening here? I want, I want to paint this picture. I want you to really get it. you got a sinner by trade. She has walked into a Pharisee's home. You don't do that. You don't do that as a sinner by trade. To open yourself up just to public ridicule. The middle class spiritual leaders of that time. You don't walk into a Pharisee's house. The Pharisee invited Jesus into his house. And she learned that Jesus was in there. Reclining at the table. His feet were facing outward. And she as a sinner. She walks in. To that house, she bows down at the feet of Jesus in front of everybody there. It says she has alabaster flask. What that is, is it's perfume. And these women who were women of trade, sinners by trade, these women, they would, if you, if you read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, you remember when I preached that, you remember what they'd do? They would braid their hair. Remember how they'd braid their hair and they'd wear 
wear earrings and all that stuff, remember? And she would put this, this ointment, this perfume, she would wear it as a necklace. You know what that was meant for? To entice men. That's what it was meant for. To draw attention to herself. Her hair would be braided and she would be having these, these earrings on and all that. And she would wear this perfume over her. And it was meant to seduce. If you, uh, if you look at Proverbs chapter 7, go ahead and turn there. Turn to Proverbs chapter 7. Starting with verse 10. Look how it describes this, this type of woman. And behold, the woman meets him, dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. She's loud and wayward. Loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market, and at every corner she lies in wait. She seizes him and kisses him, and with bold face she says to him, I had to offer sacrifices, and today I have paid my vows. So now I have come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly. I have found you. I have spread my couch with coverings, colored linens for the Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloe, cinnamon. See what, see what she's doing? She's making it smell good, to be enticing, to seduce. And this woman here that's bowing at the feet of Jesus... That was her lifestyle. That was her lifestyle. She heard about Jesus. What'd she do? She walks into the Pharisee's house and she bows at the feet of Jesus. And that ointment that she had used to seduce others, she was pouring on the feet of Jesus. That hair that she had braided to seduce others, what was she doing? She was wiping the feet of Jesus with it. Church, that's, that's repentance. That's what it means to be all in, to fall before Jesus as a broken believer, repenting of your sins, pouring it out at the feet of Jesus as a broken believer and committing to him in front of everyone that may judge you. Everyone that may put you down and ridicule you. No, no, no. She doesn't care because she's at the feet of Jesus and that's the only thing that matters. You see this beautiful picture of what a true believer looks like. Someone that's all in. Someone that truly repents of their sins. So you see three things here. All in follower. All in followers, number one, true followers of God bow at the feet of Jesus in brokenness. And we see this here. That if you want to be an all in follower of Jesus, you have to bow at his feet in brokenness. In brokenness. Broken over your sin. Broken over your unholiness. Bowing at the feet of the one who is holy. That's what a true follower looks like. Someone that's all in. I'm bowing at the feet of Jesus. Bowing before God. Number two. True followers of God repent and commit. That's what she's doing by pouring that perfume. She's repenting of that. She's pouring it at the feet of Jesus and saying, you are worthy of everything. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And she's weeping. Have you ever wept before Jesus over your sin? Did your sin break you and you bow down and you weep for him? God, I'm sorry. I am sorry for my sins, but I thank you for saving me. So I turn from that sin. I, I, whatever I had in this life that I used for sin, I turn it over to you so I can bow at your feet, so I can commit my life to you. That's what a true follower looks like. All in. You don't hold on to things of this world that are sinful. You repent. You throw them at the feet of Jesus. You don't fall for the temporal things. You bow to Jesus who is eternal. Number three, true followers need to understand they are forgiven. We'll read the rest of this in a moment. But look at verse um, 48. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Could you imagine hearing that? Can you imagine her, a sinner by trade, who's been judged by the Pharisees, looked down on by the Pharisees, the religious leaders of that time? 
Could you imagine the Savior of the world saying, your sins are forgiven? You almost, you almost wonder, what about this sin? What about this sin? There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What about this sin I did five years ago? Your sins are forgiven. Because Jesus can do that. So that's what a follower looks like. Now, now also, now I want you to see kind of what a, what a fan looks like. Let's, let's read this again. Verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house. So the Pharisee asked him and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And wiped them with her hair, the hair of her head, and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Look at this. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman who, uh, this is who is touching him. For she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. Don't miss that. Say it, teacher. She's bowing down to him as what? As Lord. Savior. Simon's questioning Jesus' sovereignty, his wisdom. Jesus, I have something to tell you, Simon. He says, well, say it, teacher. <laughs> the insult. Listen to what he said. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, from whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? Image bearer of God. I entered your house. Listen to this. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and has wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. You see what he's saying? This, this washing Jesus' feet, this was customary. This is what you did during that time. When you had a guest, when you offered a guest into your home, you would wash their feet. And so by not washing his feet, you know what the Pharisee's doing? Insulting Jesus. By calling him teacher, you know what he's doing? He's insulting Jesus. Jesus. And I wonder if we do that. I wonder if that's what fans do. Not, not followers, because followers exalt Jesus. I wonder if that's what fans do. They insult Jesus. The King of kings and Lord of lords that you only call on him um, when you need something. That's when you call on him. When life's tough, you, you may call on him. You may even um, think you're appeasing him because, well, God, I come to church every so often. I'm a fan of you. Now, you haven't changed my life. I'm not devoting my life to you. I'm not bringing you in my home to serve you and wash your feet. But I do invite you in my home. I put a cross up on my wall. There's a difference, church. There's a difference in putting a cross up on your wall and a sticker on your car and being a faithful follower of Jesus. There's a difference. This Pharisee wanted to bring in Jesus. He wanted to see what he had to say. But he wasn't bowing down before him. He wasn't washing his feet. It was about the Pharisee. He was going to see if he could catch Jesus. And I wonder how many people that call themselves Christians are like that. That they play Christianity. They're a fan of Jesus. Sometimes they come to church. Sometimes they do a little thing here or there. Sometimes they give. Sometimes their life is different, but not usually. I'm a fan of that. I want to go to heaven. I want to live my life, though. I want to live my life the way I want to live it, and I want to consume, and I want to consume, and I want to consume, and I even want worship to be about me, but then when I die, I do want to go to heaven because I'm a fan of Jesus. I'd like to be with him forever. It beats the alternative. 
Church, that's not Christianity. That's not it. We're followers, not fans. Followers bow at his feet and they repent. We wash his feet with our tears because he matters more to us than anything else or what anyone would ever think or say or, or do to us. He matters more. He matters more. So fans may acknowledge his wisdom, but they insult his deity and his glory. Fans may acknowledge his wisdom, but they insult his deity and his glory. Fans deny his sovereignty, and fans are usually have a works-based religion that God would be happy with them because they actually came one Sunday out of a month. Fans treat Jesus like a teacher. Well, he has some good things to say that sometimes blesses my heart. But they don't follow him as master. Fans love the temporal, what they can get out of it. They don't ever look to the eternal. There are a lot of fans in American Christianity. And I want to be very frank when I say that. There are a lot of fans. And you have the opportunity today to be a follower. You have an opportunity today to be all in. Because one day in your short little life, you will pass away and you will stand before God in judgment. You'll stand before him. And uh, sadly, many of you, or some of you, will hear this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And cast out demons in your name. And do many mighty works in your name. We were a fan of you, God. We did works because of you. Didn't we do that? And then I will, then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. It's one of the scariest verses in Scripture. It's one of the scariest verses in Scripture. Fans will hear that. Followers will be welcome in to bow at the feet of Jesus. I have a, a letter here. I love this. It was the first um, Protestant American missionary from the States. He wrote this to his uh, father-in-law. I love this. Mr. Judson. So Mr. Judson wrote this to his father-in-law. He was asking for a girl uh, whose name's Anne Hasselton, hand in marriage. He was asking her father for her hand in marriage. First missionary, Protestant missionary from North America. And this is what he said to his prospective uh, father-in-law. This is what he said. I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring. To see her no more in this world. Whether you can consent to her departure to a heathen land, to the Burma people, in her subjection to the hardships and suffering of a missionary life, whether you can consent to her exposure to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you? For the sake 
of perishing immortal souls for the sake of Zion and the glory of God. Can you consent to all this in the hope of soon meeting your daughter in a world of glory with a crown of righteousness brightened by the acclamation of praise which shall resound in her Savior from many Burmese saved through her means. Can you consent? Can you? Are you all in enough? That if you were the father, would you consent? Would you send your daughter to a Another country to maybe be persecuted for the name of Jesus. Say, Pastor, that, that's hard. Jesus is everything to us. Or he's nothing to us. We do what he calls us to do because he's master. We're not. Pastor, that's too, that's too big a task the only one that will get you to heaven is to bow at the feet of Jesus and to give him a blank check with your life and to go where he calls you to go and do what he calls you to do because you're all in and you love him more than this world and the comforts of this world and even your family that you love Jesus more that's why he says you must hate your father and mother and wife and children even your own life why because Jesus is more worthy so here you are, 2019, me as your pastor, I'm telling you and I'm asking you. I'm asking you to be all in. I'm asking you, we're going, we're going to preach on this for five weeks. We're going to look at different parts of our life and to give ourselves a check, are we all in? I'm asking you this morning, which are you, a fan or a follower? Which are you?